Hello, everyone. Welcome to our tenth colloquium, um, our open colloquium to the public. Uh, this week, we are hosting uh, Professor Kardar from MIT, and um, our participants are still joining in. Uh, and currently, we are also live on YouTube at our Kadiras University channel. So now, I would like to um, pass uh, to our president. Uh, Professor Durkanoğlu Feyiz to introduce Professor Kardar. Thank you, Yeşim. It's, I'm very pleased and honored to introduce Professor Mehran Kardar from MIT as the speaker of this colloquium that is open to everyone. And before that, I want to again thank Nihat Ojam who organized this meeting. And again, for this today meeting, we have exceptional speaker. And I want to give a little information about Mehran, and then I will pass to Nihat, and, and I will explain why I want to do it too, why I want to pass it to Nihat. And uh, Mehran, born in Iran, and has received his BA in physics from University of Cambridge in year 1979, and then obtained his PhD from MIT in year 1983, uh, he has several awards, a few of them Guggenheim Fellowship for Natural Sciences US and Canada, and then Presidential Young Investigator Award. Now, I was he was also the host scientist at MIT when I was visiting MIT in, uh, I don't know how many years ago, I don't remember, in year 2007 and 2009. And I'm, I'm really happy to meet with him. He is an exceptional person. And guess what? When he was doing his PhD, his advisor was Professor Nihat Berkir when he was a, a professor at the MIT. And I'm sure Nihat has a few things to talk about. Mehran, Mehran thank you very much for becoming the speaker of today's uh, colloquium. And I, I'm really happy to see you even online and hope to see you physically sometime soon. Thank you. Uh, hello. Hello, Mehran. Hello, everybody. Uh, this, of course, we go back so far uh, uh, to so far ago with the Mehran. Uh, as friends and professionals, we're so intertwined that this is truly an emotional moment for me. And I'm very, first of all, grateful for him to join to the, in our colloquium. And more than that, though, I'm grateful for the influential role he has played in my personal and in my professional life. He is one of the persons who has most influenced me professionally. And I, I thought I was very lucky to collaborate with him, to know him, to take him in an, as an example, and to watch him flourish uh, the prizes and the uh, awards that he has won can are can go on forever and then there's going to be much more of it uh, but as important as that maybe more important than that uh, in Mehran uh, I have a friend who's a very kind very thoughtful person and from that point of view he's also an example and in this kindness and thoughtfulness has come hosting many people, including our president from our country, our yearly students who go there, and also coming, visiting us many times in Turkey, giving lectures, and this is one of these visits. Uh, thank you very much, Mehran, for being yourself. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nihat. Thank you, Sondan. It's a pleasure to uh, be talking to you. Let me see if I can uh, share my screen. Maybe the host has to allow that because I uh, don't see that option. So can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay. So uh, thank you, Nihat. Thank you, Sondan. Uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, interact uh, with you. Uh, with Nihat, of course, we go all the way back to uh, the pleasure I had to be his student uh, uh, when I joined MIT in 1979. And as Nihat said, our lives have been intertwined since to the extent that uh, uh, many people think that we are the same person. So uh, there was uh, some announcement for some other activity that was to be made and they needed a photograph. So I guess they went to the web uh, 
And when I was giving this photograph, I had Nihat, uh, Nihat's picture instead of mine over there. So, so I'm uh, happy to be associated with Nihat and with Soldan also. So the talk that I'm going to uh, give today is regarding the issue of uh, affinity maturation uh, of antibodies and targeting viral spikes. It's uh, somewhat of a timely topic. Uh, so I will sort of uh, do an introduction, uh, starting with the adaptive immune response. The adaptive immune system that we all have is uh, a very intricate system whose function is to fight pathogens that they have developed, as in the case of uh, uh, the virus that causes COVID-19, uh, uh, many years after uh, most of us uh, have been born. So how is it that our body can manage to find uh, and recognize pathogens that uh, uh, continue to be developed? So I will uh, introduce uh, the topic of uh, uh, virus infection through this uh, uh, small uh, video from YouTube. I hope you can hear the sound from the video. Uh, now, the thing that I would like you to focus is uh, these orange molecules that are protruding out of the virus. Contact. This is the moment when infection begins. How does infection happen? You see the tiny shapes there on the virus particle surface? They seem like random blobs. In reality, they are tiny keys, proteins that have evolved to the perfect shape and size, enabling them to unlock these receptors on the surface of this lung cell. Like a smile and a handshake, the virus deceives this lung cell and is welcomed in where it will command the cell to make more virus particles. Okay, so given the infection by something like a virus, how does the immune system fight that? And the next uh, video is going to give you uh, some idea of that. This is a more ugly looking uh, virus, uh, but it has the same spikes on its surface. And uh, the immune system creates antibodies, these Y-shaped molecules, whose task it is to inactivate the spikes of the virus and give signals to some other particles from the immune system that come and uh, digest and remove the virus. So let me summarize the characters that we saw in these short videos. Uh, the cause of the infection is the virus particle who uses these keys in the form of spikes on its surface to uh, infect the cell. And the body responds by releasing these antibodies that deactivate the spikes. And as I will explain a little bit later, the antibodies, these Y-shaped molecules, are receptors that are created in the surface of B cells to be very specific to the spikes of the virus. Now, once I see these kinds of animations, I'm usually interested in figuring out what the characters actually look in reality. So let, let's look at some electron micrographs of uh, viruses and the spikes on their surfaces. This is influenza, and you can see a tree of uh, spikes growing out of its surface. Similarly, with the virus that causes measles, uh, uh, th this is another respiratory virus, hepatitis. And we can see in all cases, there are many, many spikes coming out of the surface. Now, the focus of this talk is actually going to be on HIV, and you look at it and it looks very different in that there are very few spikes that are emerging on its surface. And we can quantify this. 
essentially these different viruses have different sizes and diameters. So we can convert these diameters to some surface area, count the number of spikes on each one of the virus, and construct a surface density of spikes. An appropriate unit that we will come back to is how many per 100 nanometers squared. And we can see that for practically all viruses within a factor of two, the density of spikes is one per 100 nanometers. But suddenly HIV is very different and it is two orders of magnitude less in terms of these uh, spikes uh, existing on its surface. So we were puzzled by this. We asked the virologists if they had any explanation of this and uh, they did not. So we said, okay, maybe this is a good topic to think about. And uh, given that I started by telling you about how the immune system is responding uh, to uh, uh, viruses, maybe a good question to ask is uh, whether the spike density on the surface of the virus has somehow evolved to evade the immune response of the body. So in order to uh, test this scenario, we have to answer the question of how does the immune system create antibodies? The process by which antibodies are generated is called affinity maturation. And I will uh, describe it to you both uh, in two ways because it's an important thing to uh, remember and understand. Uh, essentially, once an infection has taken place, uh, the pathogen is carried via the lymphatic system to lymph nodes. Within a lymph node, then uh, these entities called germinal centers form when a a cell that is bearing a pathogen arrives to the lymph node. Now, within the germinal center, then the process of occurs by which antibodies are generated. As I said, antibodies are receptors that exist on the surface of B cells that are present in the lymphatic system, but they have not seen this particular pathogen before. So the picture that you see over here is a particular cell of the immune uh, response, not the adaptive immune system, but the innate immune system, but the distinction currently is not important for us. This cell that is called a follicular dendritic cell has grabbed a number of these viruses or pathogens and brought them via the lymphatic system to the lymph node and this germinal center has formed. This is a signal to the B cells that have not seen this virus before, that they should try to evolve an antibody towards this uh, virus. So the way that that happens is that the naive B cells start to replicate, but the process of replication is uh, associated also with a lot of mutation. So because of the mutation, different versions of receptors on the surface of this B cell form that are in this picture indicated by colors. The different replicated versions try to bind and eat this virus. And that's how a process of selection takes place to see which one of the receptors is better at grabbing uh, the virus particles and ingesting it. The ones that are not successful die away. The process is called apoptosis. The ones that are successful uh, get signals from what are called helper T cells that they should uh, go through this cycle of replication and mutation again. So over a period of about two weeks, there are of the order of uh, 30 rounds of uh, uh, mutation selection. Each time the virus gets uh, eaten more and the receptors get more adapted to uh, binding this virus. And by the end of uh, these two weeks, the affinity of uh, these receptors to the virus increases by a factor of 1,000 to 10,000. And the resulting B cells that can generate these high affinity 
antibodies uh, become uh, plasma cells that release these antibodies uh, to combat the virus and are also maintained as memory B cells to combat the possibility of future infection. Because this process is uh, important to understand, I also have another version of it that is explained in YouTube with the animations, so they can do this much better than I can. The pathogen is engulfed by a B cell bearing antigen specific antibodies. Processing and presentation of this antigen to a T cell completes the activation of the B cell. Although the antibodies on this B cell have sufficiently high affinity to allow activation, their affinity is not high enough to facilitate an effective immune response. The means by which antibody affinity will be enhanced is a microevolutionary process involving mutation and selection. The first step in honing this affinity is creation of a germinal center. Then, in the nucleus of this activated B cell, along the gene encoding antibody proteins, the activation-induced cytidine deaminase protein, AID, induces point mutations. The rate of mutation jumps by a factor of 1 million. So this is important that uh, somehow, uh, as part of the process, there has to be a lot of mutation that takes place in the receptor so that by chance they can get better at recognizing the target. Producing antibodies with a range of affinity for the target antigen. The germinal center in which the centrocytes are proliferating also contains follicular dendritic cells, FDCs, which present antigen on their surface. Competition for this limited quantity of antigen will provide the basis of selection among the centrosites. So the whole thing comes to the binding affinity of these Y-shaped molecules to, in this case, the green targets and how well they can bind to them. And once they bind to them, they can eat and digest the, the uh, target particles. Capturing more and more antigen. Higher affinity antibodies induce a greater spreading response. The centrocyte contracts stripping antigen from the surface. This captured antigen is presented to T cells. And this T cell presentation is important because the T cells are the uh, agent by which the decision that the cell should die or to, rep to replicate is given. Only the highest affinity centrocytes remain from the variable population after competitive selection. They will continue to mutate and divide. Again, the range of affinity provides the basis for selection by competitive binding. As unsuccessful cells undergo apoptosis, affinity increases with each generation. So and what I will be trying next is to describe how this distribution of uh, affinities changes as a function of time through these rounds of uh, uh, mutation selection replication. A large population of high affinity centrocytes is produced. The cells that have survived this competition can then differentiate into immune effector cells, like plasma cells which produce massive amounts of these high affinity antibodies. So this is how the antibodies are eventually generated and released by the B cells. Okay, so uh, with uh, Professor Arup Chakrabarti and Shen Shen Wang, who was a postdoc at MIT until a few years ago, we developed a computational model that went through these steps that I outlined for you, uh, presentation of uh, uh, pathogen, uh, replication and mutation of the B cells, their competition to eat the virus par uh, target by increasing affinity, they're getting a signal to replicate and go through this process again via the T cells. And so we essentially had a computational model uh, through which we can describe the behavior of affinity maturation. And we got a number of results. But my philosophy is that if I give you some results coming from some model, then 
uh, not much uh, insight has been given. And it turns out that the appropriate result of this model and the insights can very, very easily be captured by uh, realizing that this process is an example of uh, uh, evolution of a population that is a very well-known process. So imagine that all of these different B cells that are competing with each other because of the mutation have different affinities. And because of the different affinities, they have different fitness, which is a function of affinity. And what that fitness means is that the fitter uh, individuals produce more children. So the number of individuals that have a particular affinity ability to bind changes as a function of time proportionately to uh, uh, the fitness. The fitter ones will grow exponentially at a more rapid rate. So this fitness is an important parameter in population evolution describes how the number with that fitness is growing as a function of time. Now these numbers, we can think of them as a weight and calculate the average of various quantities using this number as a weight, appropriately normalized. Now, once we have this formula and the above formula about how the number changes, we can also calculate how these averages over the population are changing as a function of time. For example, the average of the fitness itself, it's very easy to put the fitness over here and take derivatives and show that the variation of the fitness over time is proportional to the variance of fitness. This is an important result in population evolution that is known as Roland Fisher's fundamental theorem of natural selection. Essentially, it says that fitness increases, the rate at which fitness increases is proportional to the variance in the population. Now, what we are interested in is not fitness, but some kind of a property of the individuals. For example, it could be a eye color strength, in this case, affinity, uh, where fitness is a function of that particular uh, uh, trait. And one can then calculate exactly the analog of this statement to find how the average of some particular trait changes as a function of time. And rather than the variance, one finds the covariance of fitness with that particular trait, how that trait influences fitness in a covariance form. Now, additionally, uh, the original equation that I had written did not allow for mutations. One could modify this equation to also allow the changes that are on average due to mutations. This new equation is another important equation of population genetics. It's called Price's equation. Essentially, uh, this affinity that we see, uh, there's a probability of individuals having that particular affinity, and that distribution changes as a function of time because of this formula that we have over here. If we assume that this distribution is roughly a Gaussian uh, of some mean value and some variance, then it is very easy to sort of convert this equation uh, to the following. It essentially says that the rate at which the mean value of this distribution changes is proportional to how that change increases the fitness. So the increasing fitness is essentially what is going to derive the change in the value of the mean of this distribution. How rapidly it does so is proportional to the variance because the more variance you have, you can pick from the furthest part of the distribution. Of course, the variance itself is another par parameter of this distribution that changes as a function of time. Uh, we are going to assume just for simplicity that the most important change is because of the hypermutation and all of the other things that are related to the fitness can be approximated away. If we do that, then essentially it's a simple equation that says that the variance 
uh, increases proportionately in time because of the mutations. And if we substitute that in this formula, we have a very, very simple equation that says that the increase in affinity or some other trait as a function of a rescaled time, where rescaled time through this equation is related to uh, mutations as well as the initial value of this distribution, that this increase is simply proportional to the derivative of fitness with respect to this uh, trait that we are looking at. So in order to explain various properties of uh, the evolution of the spike of the virus and the response of the uh, immune system, I will use this uh, set of equations due to Fisher and Price uh, to describe this process of affinity maturation. But in order to do so, I certainly need the formula that describes how the fitness depends on this quantity that we are interested in, which is the binding affinity of the B cell receptors to the target. So again, the process that we are interested is these Y-shaped molecules that are on the surface of B cells. Omega is the parameter that describes how well they are able to bind and digest uh, the spike targets. And we want to know how that quantity changes as a function of time. And essentially these Y-shaped molecules uh, have a part on the surface of the Y that through this hypermutation is very much varied. And it is this part that has to bind to the target. So uh, as I said, in order to use the Fisher-Price equation, I need to know how the fitness of B cells that carry this particular uh, receptor that is the number of children that they produce through this process of affinity maturation depends on the strength of this bind. I expect that this fitness is going to be an increasing function of the ability to bind this affinity, but eventually there is just how good you can make it, this quantity. And so this increase in fitness as a function of this strength is going to slow down. That's the only qualitative thing that I need. And I just uh, pose some kind of a formula that carries that dependence that initially grows linearly maybe, and then eventually saturates. Uh, now, rather than just omega, in this formula, I have also introduced the parameter n, which is the density of spikes over here. Because I also expect that this binding and hence the success of the B cell depends not only on the affinity, but the number of targets that it can bind to. So I have assumed that it is proportional to the number of targets or the density of targets, again, in a manner that eventually has to slow down because there's just so much that you can pack on the surface. So in order to use the price equation, I need not the fitness, but the derivative of the fitness that derives the evolution of this quantity, which is the average binding. And so the derivative of this formula is a formula that starts with an initial force that gradually decays as the affinity gets better and better. Essentially, it becomes harder and harder to refine the process by which you can bind more and more. Now, this is a simple uh, differential equation that all of us hopefully can immediately solve in our head by putting this denominator to the other side and integrating it. And the solution tells me that the average value of this fitness changes with this time-like parameter in this uh, simple fashion. And this is a behavior that initially grows linearly uh, finally, it continues to grow, but because of the reduced force, it slows down. So what does this curve that describes the evolution of this fitness uh, as a function of uh, time, not fitness, but this affinity as a function of time and density look like? Essentially, always as a function of time for any density, 
uh, the affinity gets better and better. So as you go to higher and higher times, irrespective of the density of antigen on the surface, the affinity is going to get better and better. We're keeping it. Uh, but what we see is that the rate of growth slows down if you are at high density. And as a result, this curve develops some kind of a knee. And uh, the meaning of that is kind of uh, easy to understand. Uh, at small density, there aren't many targets to see and get better against. At high density, there are just too many targets so that there is not reason to have competition and get better. You can get better, but the rate of growth of, uh, is slowed down. This is actually reminiscent to one of the earliest works uh, that described affinity maturation, which is due to uh, Hermann Eisen, who then became a colleague at MIT later on. And this is in 1964. He says that changes in affinity increase progressively with time after immunization. And the rate of increase was most conspicuous when small quantities uh, were injected and uh, delayed when large doses of antigen were injected. Now, I'm not talking about doses of antigen but it really captures this uh, difference between what is happening at small values of uh, target and large values of target that uh, uh, the system is trying to evolve against. Now, uh, you may not want to sort of believe this formula. So I told you that we had this more sophisticated computational model uh, that we uh, uh, put various elements of the process into and simulate it. And indeed, when we do that with the more complicated computational model, we get the same kind of dependence in the affinity as a function of spike density. Uh, the thing that comes out of the more uh, computationally intensive model is precisely where the location of this peak is. And so I need some kind of a unit for density and uh, that unit for density comes from the following, that these Y-shaped molecules have some characteristic size. They have two heads, and there is a distance between these two heads. And you can grab the target by one head or by two heads. And there is a characteristic area over which uh, this uh, uh, Y-shaped molecule can scan the surface of the virus. And not surprisingly, uh, the maximal density turns out to be a fraction of the area that is uh, scanned by this Y-shaped molecule on the surface. So the conclusion of our modeling of uh, affinity maturation is that uh, if we uh, try to look at the affinity of uh, antibodies that the uh, body can generate against a particular virus, uh, the resulting antibodies have uh, a weak uh, binding affinity at low spike density and relatively weak at high spike density. And there is an intermediate density that would create the most potent antibodies. So if the virus wants to avoid a potent response from the antibody, it would try to avoid this uh, area where the density is maximal. So indeed, in reality, practically all of the viruses have avoided this intermediate density and gone to the high density limit. There is one exception with HIV. And it is clear that certainly a, a virus has lots of different forces that could govern the choice of the spike density. And for example, presumably the more spikes on its surface, the virus is going to be more effective in infecting the cells. So infectivity is something that should increase with the number of spikes. So maybe the optimal solution uh, for viruses is to avoid antibody uh, 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 potency 
and yet be highly effective by going to the high spike density limit, which is what most uh, viruses have done. So then the question is why HIV chose a different strategy. The reason for that goes back to one step that I mentioned in the affinity maturation process. I said that the, in order to cycle through this uh, uh, rounds of uh, selection mutation competition, uh, a signal had to be given to the B cells that have been successful that they should start replicating and mutating again. And that signal is given by uh, helper T cells within these germinal centers. Now, these helper T cells happen to be the target of the HIV virus. And indeed, once the virus of HIV infects an individual, uh, what happens is that the red shows the number of virus particles in the bloodstream of the patient. They go up very rapidly. Concomitantly, the number of helper T cells indicated with the blue uh, line here go down because they are destroyed by this uh, uh, virus. Now, eventually the immune system kicks in despite the reduction in the number of helper T cells and the effect of the immune system is to kill the virus and the number of T cells uh, recovers. But for reasons that I will describe next, unlike most other infections, the number of virus particles does not go down to zero and indicate recovery, but a small pool of it remains in the patient. And over a period rather than weeks of years, this uh, a competition between the virus and the immune system continues. Eventually, the immune system loses after a number of years, and full-blown AIDS causes uh, uh, complications to develop in the patient. So because the target of uh, the HIV virus is this helper T cells that are reduced dramatically in the initial stages of the infection, uh, the rate at which uh, affinity maturation can progress is reduced because there aren't enough T cells to give the signal for more rounds of uh, uh, mutations. So rather than dealing with a curve that corresponds to the right number of T cells, because of the re reduction in the number of T cells, effectively the immune system is growing slower. And at the initial times, this knee that we had over here does not develop. So as far as the HIV is concerned, the affinity of uh, uh, these uh, B cells and uh, antibodies against uh, them, their dependence on density uh, continues to increase. And the only way to avoid high affinity uh, uh, antibodies is to go to the low density limit. Now, one can ask whether there are other reasons, such as structural, that prevent putting too many spikes on the surface of HIV. The answer seems to be no, because for the uh, simian version of the virus, SIV, mutations have been created in the lab that can cause the number of spikes on the surface of SIV to be increased by two orders of magnitude. And when diff these different mutants are placed on a Petri dish with their target T cells, the ones that have more uh, spikes are more successful in creating spots that indicate that they are infecting more T cells. So clearly, these mutant versions are much more effective than the ordinary versions. Yet, when both of them are injected into the uh, monkey, after a few months, when uh, uh, viruses are looked at from the body of the monkey and from the bloodstream of the monkey, they're seen to revert back to the low density uh, version. So there is no structural barrier, but there is something to do uh, with potentially the way that the virus interacts uh, with the uh, inside the monkey that causes the density to be preferred 
it is of course very difficult to uh, make some kind of a claim as to why some particular virus has evolved in, a, uh, in one way or the other. So what I've said here should be regarded as a conjecture. However, this issue of optimal density for affinity maturation that we have discovered may be used for some other purpose. And the purpose that I have in mind are synthetic vaccines. So let me remind you of how vaccination takes place. One way is to uh, take the virus and somehow make it uh, uh, a weaker version, disable its ability to uh, replicate, for example, and inject this disabled version of the virus into the body of the patient as a vaccine and then the immune system recognizes, for example, the spikes on the surface of this disabled virus and creates antibodies against it. And these antibodies will remain in the memory uh, B cells ready for potentially when the actual virus is uh, 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 infects the person. One difficulty is that there is always a small but finite risk that this disabled virus reactivates and this reversion causes uh, uh, the actual disease that you are trying to avoid. So you say, okay, since the target is really not the entire virus, but the spikes on the surface of the virus, why not just present the immune system with the spikes and as a vaccine, inject these subunits inside the patient? The thing is that the way that the immune system has evolved, certain other cells have to carry these particular vaccine and present them in the germinal center. And uh, the system has evolved to do so with actual particles of actual virus rather than with segments. And so this is usually not a very effective way of vaccination. What people have uh, developed recently are these nanoparticle vaccines where uh, you attach these uh, uh, spikes uh, by uh, DNA or RNA to the surface of a nanoparticle. And uh, this has the advantage of both of them. It kind of looks like a virus, but it's never going to be uh, uh, have the property of uh, an entire replicating virus. It just presents the target to the immune system. So the lesson that we have learned is that in order to create the most effective version of these uh, uh, synthetic viruses, you should not pack them very much with uh, the target uh, spikes, but you have to choose this optimal density that is somewhat intermediate in order to elicit uh, the best uh, uh, antibodies against this process. Uh, so let's go and take a better look at the actual spike of uh, the HIV virus. Uh, this spike has a part that is like the key that we saw in the first video that opens the targets. And as I said, the targets are some receptors on the surface of T cells. It's called a CD4 binding site. So this is the important part of the spike of the HIV virus that causes it to uh, infect the T cells. Now, we know that despite knowing this virus for 20 years, no effective vaccination against HIV has been developed. Why is that? The reason is that this, uh, this spike is highly mutable. So HIV is an RNA virus and the process by which it uh, replicates within the body of uh, the patient is very mutation, uh, uh, it has lots of mutations in it. And so what happens is that this uh, spike uh, continuously mutates. Now, of course, it cannot 
mutate everywhere. For example, this particular site that has to, that is the key to opening the, uh, the receptors of the T cell cannot be mutated. This part has to remain conserved. But this conserved part happens to be shielded by lots of other residues, which are not particularly important to the process of infecting the T cell and highly mutable. So what happens is that a virus bearing this spike is uh, injected into the body. Uh, it happens to come to the body of the uh, infected individual and is presented uh, in the germinal center. And uh, the immune system creates antibodies that recognize the spike and deactivate it. But typically what the antibodies recognize are these shielding residues, which are not so important to the virus. So the virus uh, uh, can potentially mutate and make these shields in a way that the antibodies that were generated will no longer recognize. So essentially during this process of uh, the several weeks to years that this virus is in the uh, patient, it is constantly mutating away the shields while maintaining the appropriate binding site intact. And this is how it evades the immune system and also why we have not uh, uh, discovered a good vaccine against this virus. However, a few years ago, it was discovered that some rare individuals, not immediately, but after several years and in low amounts, produce a kind of antibody that are called broadly neutralizing antibodies, which are capable of ignoring these variations in the virus uh, spike and homing on the conserved part. And so they are called broadly neutralizing because there is a broad spectrum of these viruses uh, that are targeted by these antibodies. So the lesson that we sort of took from this is that in principle, one can develop antibodies that are potent and broadly neutralizing and targeting the appropriate conserved site. But how can we uh, teach the immune system to ignore all of these distractions and focus on the conserved part and create a virus to do so. So we reasoned that what the immune system of these uh, rare individuals has succeeded to do, and to do this, it has been through seeing a lot of different variants and recognizing that these different variants have a particular thing in common. So we said that to, to replicate that through an artificial vaccination, maybe what we should do is not to present as a vaccine just a single variant of the spike, but many variants of the spikes with the same conserved part. Okay, so we tried this in our computational model. Uh, we uh, uh, presented to our computational model a cocktail of variants that had different uh, shield parts, but the same conserved part, or they had a uh, conserved part and they, they had a very different variants. In fact, we uh, presented to our computational model three such variants. And what we found was that in our computational model, uh, there was no success. No broadly anti uh, neutralizing antibodies were developed in response to the presentation of the cocktail. And the reason for that was something like this, that essentially when the three different variants were presented, uh, where the red was the common part, but the different colors indicate the variable parts that were different, during the process of affinity maturations, uh, there were some receptors that were evolved that were kind of uh, uh, good for recognizing this variant, but in the next round, they would encounter the other variant and then they wouldn't recognize anything and they would die away. So there was a lot of frustration in trying to evolve against many variants that were distinct. So what we did next 
was rather than presenting all of the variants simultaneously, we presented them in sequence. We first gave one, then the second, and then the third, and we found in our computational model that we generated these broadly neutralizing antibodies. And so the thing is that in each round, there was really no frustration. And gradually in the first round, you would recognize some general shapes and some fraction that were uh, looking at the conserved part. And that fraction was increased the second time around where the same conserved part was indicated and the ones that were kind of their footprint was uh, uh, away from the conserved part would die away, but then there were some fraction that would get better and the third time they would get even better. And uh, so once we had this computational model, our collaborators went and tested this in mice and did exactly the same thing with mice, three variants either as a cocktail or in sequence, and they found that they could create broadly neutralizing, uh, uh, better broadly neutralizing antibodies through the uh, sequential rather than the cocktail mechanism. So the challenge here indeed is that the immune system uh, has developed as a dynamical system with two fixed points. One outcome is that the whole system dies away, doesn't create anything or the other outcome is that it creates specific antibodies for what is presented to it. Neither of them is good for the perspective of generating broadly neutralizing antibodies. And so we want to avoid both of these by sort of broadening the path by which uh, uh, it has to proceed, hoping that it will not uh, fall into either of these uh, uh, cases. So, Indeed, there must be some general strategy to elicit these broadly neutralizing antibodies, avoiding frustration, avoiding rapid specialization uh, to uh, a particular epitope. And so uh, one has a lot of parameters to explore. Given that there are a lot of parameters to explore, it is good to have this computational model, but I can also give you some uh, hand-waving reason as to one, one method is better than the other. Essentially, in the computational model as well as in the experiment, what we did was we presented to the immune system variants of the target. These variants of the target had a small conserved part in common and they had larger variable components. So I'm going to indicate the affinity of the uh, uh, B cells or the antibodies that are developed to the conserved part by omega C to the different variable parts by omega one, omega two, omega three, omega four, or omega alpha in general. And I assume that the fitness is related to how they bind to some particular variant that has both the variable part and some component that is the conserved part. And just to indicate that essentially the conserved part is hard to get at, I have put a small parameter epsilon here that I'm going to uh, also use to organize my calculation by assuming that epsilon is less than one. And again, I uh, saturate all of the fitness, how they grow as a function of these affinities by the sum of the, all of the affinities that we have. So essentially uh, the fitness, I'm assuming all these were the fitnesses when one of these is present, when multiple versions of the uh, are simultaneously presented as a cocktail, uh, I assume that I have to add the fitness of all of these, but uh, to uh, uh, take care of this frustration that we see, I assume that actually fitness when I uh, give multiple variants is reduced by some parameter that is proportional or that is an increasing function of the number of variants. Also in order to be fair 
in comparing, say, a cocktail when multiple things are presented with case where a single one is presented, if a cocktail is presented that has S component, I will assume that the strength of each one of them is reduced by a factor of S. Uh, this factor of lambda S is not particularly important in the force that creates the evolution of these parameters because I have to take a derivative of this quantity with respect to omega. So I have essentially formulae that tell me how the affinity uh, of the uh, antibodies with respect to the variance, conserved part, as well as the total of all of them grows as a function of time. And these are exactly the type of equations that I had before that I said are very easy to integrate. And I can integrate them and find that if there is a cocktail that is presented, so all of the variants are presented simultaneously, that the affinity of the conserved part grows just very similar to the formula that I had before proportionately to epsilon, ignoring higher order factors in epsilon. And whereas if I uh, present them in sequence uh, over different time intervals that add up to the same time as I had before, then I have to add up the contributions to the growth of the affinity of the conserved part from each of these intervals in turn. And if I optimize that, I will get a value for the uh, resulting affinity in a sequential variant that can be compared to the cocktail variant and it is larger because essentially it is easier to uh, uh, present some new target and you are more enthusiastic to learn it as opposed to trying to learn many things simultaneously. Uh, so these kinds of computational models are easy to sort of give us some insight that guide in this uh, complicated process of vaccination with multiple variants of the antigens. So in summary, I started by telling you about uh, how viruses infect through the spikes on their surface and uh, how antibodies inactivate these, virus, uh, and these viral spikes. The antibodies are generated through this process of affinity maturation on B cells. Yet, if we look at these different versions of the virus, we find that HIV is special in having much fewer spikes than all the other viruses. And uh, we kind of try to relate that to the process of affinity maturation, which is a kind of uh, uh, evolution that takes place very rapidly through this hypermutation over a process of a couple of weeks in our bodies. And we found that essentially uh, the process of affinity maturation is, generates the most potent antibodies if there is both enough target and enough competition. For the case of the viral spikes, this indicates that optimal antibodies are created at a particular density. And indeed, most viruses have avoided that maximal potency by going to either higher densities or in the unique case of HIV by going to a lower density possibly related because of the fact that HIV targets the T cells and interferes with the immunity, uh, with the affinity maturation process. So we can use these lessons in order to sort of devise strategies for vaccination. And in particular, uh, for vaccination against highly mutable viruses such as HIV uh, through uh, Administrating, administering multiple versions of the variants of the thing to which against which you want to uh, acquire immunity. And essentially, uh, while I used uh, different mathematical formulas, the essence of all of this results was conceptually the fact that uh, uh, fitness grows as a function of some quantity 
initially more rapidly, uh, but then eventually uh, it has to slow down because it becomes harder and harder to learn details that can make you get better and better. So that's essentially the one concept that is guiding all of the results that we have over here. This is work that was done at the inspiration of Professor uh, Arup Chakrabarty at MIT uh, and uh, with two postdocs, Shen Shen Wang and Asaf Amitai and uh, a number of other students and postdocs have been very influential in doing this. And uh, uh, once more, I thank uh, Sondan and Mihat for giving me this opportunity to talk and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Professor Kardash. And um, to all our participants, if you have any questions, you can use the chat function uh, to type your questions, or you can raise your hand through the Zoom program. And we have some time for questions and answers. And I would like to invite Professor Barker to moderate the Q&A session. We'll, OK, we'll do. Yeah, Waiting the for the questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mehran, by the way. Uh, such calm and powerful theory with such mind-boggling topics and results. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, any questions? I see a lot of my friend, uh, uh, record audience for, for this time of the year, for any time of the year. Questions, we are waiting. Okay, I have a question which is more general, and then I will... Uh, uh, come to Chada since I started asking. So, Mehran, in a more general thing, this theory that you have developed, is it also applicable in general population dynamics? Because it seems like evolution of uh, fitness and adaptability. So it's just not uh, uh, viruses, but it should be generally adaptable. Is that true or is it too, too specialized? Uh, no, we actually, uh, we started... Uh, there's two things. There's the computational model. The computational model is rather specialized to the process of affinity maturation in the uh, germinal center. But the formulae that I presented were just based on this uh, very fundamental results of population genetics, the uh, Fisher and Price equations, and they have been applied to many, many different contexts. Uh, it's uh, in some sense the version of these Fisher Price equations that I used for uh, uh, what I had in mind are much more simple than what uh, uh, many other people are uh, using. Uh, so there is a lot of work that is uh, a number of physicists are currently working on uh, essentially evolution and modeling evolution. And the starting point are typically variants of this uh, uh, Fisher and Price equation. And uh, uh, what I kind of uh, looked at was the case where the fitness was depending on just one or a few variables. And uh, uh, more generally, the fitness is a function of many different traits. And one of the uh, interesting uh, topics that lots of physicists are currently working on is uh, interactions among these traits. Essentially, if you like going from something like a uh, uh, single variable statistical mechanics to interacting uh, statistical mechanics. So uh, uh, what I presented was really uh, the simplest variants of these equations. And as you anticipated, they can be applied to uh, many more complex systems than I have over here. Okay. Thank you, Mehran. Uh, we have a question from Chadash Kuluch. I think Chadash is a student from Hacettepe, correct me if I'm wrong, but Hacettepe University in Ankara, but comes in the summers to take our summer course at Kadiras University. And Chadash, Mehran, can you see it in chat or should I read it? Uh, yes, I can read this. So the question is whether uh, uh, viruses mutate while the antibodies are uh, uh, doing so. And uh, the answer is uh, depends on the virus that you are looking at. So certain viruses, such as, for example, uh, uh, flu, flu within uh, 
the time scale of uh, uh, one or two weeks that the patient is sick is not mutating too much within the body. And so antibodies are uh, effective in uh, uh, getting rid of it. Now, what happens with flu is that from one year to another year, it mutates. So the next year, the antibodies that you had the previous year are not good for uh, combating the new version, the new strain of uh, flu. And that's why every year you have to be vaccinated again. Some other viruses such as polio don't mutate uh, effectively over our lifetime, for example. And so you get one vaccine for polio and then you are set. Now, the worst case is indeed for HIV. And uh, uh, so for flu, essentially, once the uh, immune system has taken over, the number of virus particles goes all the way to zero. And the reason for HIV it doesn't go to zero is because it mutates. So there, here, it is mutated vi versions of the virus in the body. So as time goes on, there is a combat that is taking place between the virus that is evolving and the immune system that is evolving. And eventually for such a highly mutable virus, the immune system cannot keep up. And it is really new variants of the virus that have evolved over the lifetime of a patient that eventually destroy uh, the immune system. Okay, a correction, Chadash is from Middle East Technical University in Al-Hajettepe, correction, but he still comes and takes courses at Kadiras. Our next question, we have many in line, is from uh, Emine Ertuğrul, which as I remember well, uh, is from Bosphorus University, but takes courses at Kadiras University. Okay, so the question is about the um, geometry of the virus and uh, Indeed, uh, let me go back and take a look at the uh, shape of this particular uh, spike of the HIV. That's the one that I have. Uh, the one for flu is slightly different. It has a head and a kind of longer stem. And uh, indeed, one of the projects that uh, currently uh, is going on in Professor Chakrabarty's group is to think about the shape and geometry of this spike and uh, uh, how that is important to the affinity maturation process. So it turns out that uh, it is much easier to develop uh, antibodies towards the head of the spike as opposed to the stem of the spike that is down here. And uh, for the case of the uh, flu and some other viruses, uh, the most uh, neutralizing uh, um, antibodies are uh, targeting the stem, which is the part that is hard to get. So indeed, geometry is an important element of recognition, although again, these are uh, uh, in fact, amino acids, residues, and the chemical binding is important, but geometry is uh, another factor that one has to take into account. And also part of this uh, issue of geometry and difficulty is because if we go and look at something like the uh, uh, so, uh, the influenza virus and some of these other viruses, the spikes are very much packed together and having spikes that are packed together makes it difficult to reach uh, to the stems of the uh, uh, spike. So that's another aspect of the geometry. Uh, thank you. Our next question is from Professor Kemal Yerekci, who's the department head in the computational bio molecular biology and genetics at Kader Has University. And you'll see the question. Uh, Mehran, if you could repeat it and go from there. Okay, so if I understand, uh, the question is uh, that the aspect of the spikes that we have taken into account is just the number density of the spike. Uh, question is whether the structure of the spike also changes because of the mutation. Well, certainly the structure of the spike uh, 
is different from one virus to the other virus. Uh, question of whether the, the evolu uh, mutations of the virus can change the shape of the virus itself. I don't think that is something that uh, uh, is particularly I'm aware of. So I don't think that, uh, say, typically what is going to happen is, uh, let me go to another one of these uh, pictures. Uh, that's not the one. Okay, so uh, most of the mutations that take place in the antibodies or also for the spikes involve just one or two uh, uh, am uh, am uh, amino acids on the, uh, of this uh, molecule. And typically changing one or two amino acids does not modify the structure and geometry very much but can affect the strength of the binding to something else by uh, big factors. So typically what mutations do is to change uh, the binding affinity, but not particularly the shape and geometry as far as I know. I, I don't really know of mutations that uh, modify greatly the shape of uh, either molecule. Okay, thank you very much, Mehran. We've kept our speaker for close to an hour and a half now. Uh, let's not tire him too much, but more questions can be addressed to me or to Mehran directly. Let's all unmute our microphones and please applaud Mehran Kardar. <laughs> Mehran, thank you very much. Thank you, Niha. Thank you, Sandan. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Mehran. Let's all unmute. <laughs> Who's speaking? For, for those who haven't well. heard it. Whoever is speaking is speaking very well. Let's applaud him too. <laughs> Your echo takes a long time to go around the world. Uh, okay, thank you, Mehran. Let's, yeah, thanks, can we, thank, thank can you, Mehran. We, can you stop sharing screen so we can see you from one uh, before we part? Okay, here we are. And if you if anybody wants can turn their photographs on so we can all see that we're real people. Okay, for one, one. Let's see. Some of the some of these fellows you can recognize, <laughs> your friends in Turkey. Some of them you will meet later on. So we're very happy uh, to have you all of you people here. Well, keep safe, everybody. You okay. too, Mehran. U.S. is not so safe anymore. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> Show your pictures if you can. And I am... I am turning off. Mehran. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mehran. Bye. Say hello to all my <laughs> friends there. Uh, my, my heart is with Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.